Hello, Brianne. Today I want to talk to you about Eleanor Roosevelt. And her name was Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. The name Anna pops up quite a few times on the family tree. Um, I, it's very, very difficult for me to be even handed about Mrs. Roosevelt. I've tried to be sympathetic for her or towards her in some in some regards, but uh, she just was such a an unhappy person. And while I understand her unhappiness, I still lament uh, what it will cost her family. So she she too had a difficult life. Um, she was born into probably one of the most outstanding families in the New York Social Register in that her father was none other than Elliot Roosevelt, the brother of Teddy Roosevelt, and her mother was someone named Anna Rebecca Hall, who was also at the very top of New York society. And being born into uh, the family you know, of these two titans, you would think that Things would go well or easily for her, but they did not. And I've looked at several biographies, um, and I've, I have an autobiography of Mrs. Roosevelt that I have read in the past, and I need to read it again. She worshipped her mother. Her mother was considered one of the most beautiful people in the world, but her mother was always very aloof and, um, unki frankly, unkind to her daughter. Her mother will die when Aunt, when Eleanor is quite young, and she is left to the care, she and her two brothers are left to the care of her father, Elliot. Now, she, she loved Elliot desperately, and again, this is the younger brother of Teddy Roosevelt. She loved Elliot desperately, and he loved her and the boys as well. But he, unfortunately, was someone who suffered from, again, a term I use, morbid alcoholism. And what that means is not someone who just drinks too much occasionally, but someone who is on a path to an early death due to the effects of alcohol consumption. And bless him, he had the hardest time with this. Uh, when the boys were little, when Theodore and Elliot were little, it would certainly have seemed that Elliot would have been the brother who was least likely or more, most likely to succeed. Um, he had much better health. He had a you know quick wit, intelligence, very handsome. I don't believe his eyesight was quite as bad as his brother's, and just you know he would seem like the one that was going to grab the, the brass ring and hold on to it. Um, but, you know, things change, and depending on which biographies you read, you know, it was Teddy's aggressive, oh gosh, com uh, competitive spirit, and, you know, it was his own fault that he turned against, you know, that, that things went so badly for Elliot. I don't quite believe that. I just think there's an unfortunate string of, um, strand of, of alcoholism that ran through this family like we saw with the Adams. Uh, you know, it's, it's just here and there, and it's unfortunate. But Elliot turned into a bit of a liber libertine. That's an old Victorian era, actually predates the Victorian era. It's an old era description of someone whose morals had just completely collapsed. And uh, there's a lot of ugly stories about Elliot, and Teddy just didn't know what to do with him. Teddy had such a, a strong moral foundation. And he, he was just, just flummoxed by his brother. And the death of Anna, the aloofness of Anna prior to her early death, uh, the, their marriage had collapsed because of Elliot's behavior. And she hated, so by some accounts, she hated her husband. Uh, there's, it, there's no end to the tragedy here. All of this had a terrible effect on Eleanor. And when her father is finally unable to take care of her, he is institutionalized um, and he has a premature death himself. She is left in the care of her maternal grandmother. Uh, this does not go well. 
Some biographers say that in the care of her grandmother, she was physically abused by some other male relatives. I don't know the veracity of this. Uh, I, I just don't know. But there's financial privilege and being you know, born high on the social register does not ensure that you have an easy life. Um, and that's just, that's just terrible. Um, her grandmother did her best to keep her away from the Roosevelts. Um, you know, the Roosevelts were supposed, you know, supposedly bad influence. That's, that's just not quite true. Um, but she loved her uncle Theodore and he loved her. And in fact, you probably already know this, that when Eleanor is married to her fifth cousin, um, Franklin Roosevelt, that it will be, in fact, Theodore who gives her away. Eleanor will be sent to a girls' school in England, uh, the name of which was Allenswood, where she displayed a fabulous intellect. And she will really sort of blossom into herself, and she will describe those years as the happiest in her life. Um, she will later return against her will to enter at her, at her family's insistence into New York society, and she, she didn't like that either. But in New York, she makes a new set of friends. She will join uh, a number of ladies' organizations that were socially conscious. This was very fashionable, and I don't mean anything unkind by this, but these social conscience organizations were very fashionable for women uh, at a height who were, you know, um, among the socially elite and wealthy, but it seems to tap into a social conscience within Eleanor, and I don't want to take away from her at all about that. I believe she had a genuine concern for those who were in need, um, mothers, single mothers uh, with children. She became involved in the settlement house movement, which was a way of providing a home for those mothers and their children. Um, she, she volunteers extensively at the Rivington Street Settlement House, and, um, and she would, she would go in what we would say log in personal hours there, not just support financially or with lip service. And she liked to teach dancing and exercise and things like that for these women. And, and again, you just have to, you have to, um, admire that. In 1903, she began her friendship with her very distant cousin, Franklin, who was at that time a student at Harvard. Um, he, he saw something in her and, and you know, I don't, I don't know what he saw in her other than maybe he was just charmed by her. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my phone. He was just charmed by her personality and her sweet demeanor. Uh, she was not considered a great beauty, and he was considered extremely handsome, extremely eligible, extremely wealthy. Um, he could have probably had any woman um, that he desired. And in fact, Eleanor had suffered terribly uh, even from her own mother, about her looks. And uh, you know who's on the scene making fun of her at every instance, of course, was Alice Roosevelt. Um, just, I think, jealous of her and her father's affections for her. I think Alice was jealous that, that, uh, her, that her own father, Theodore Teddy, um, loved Eleanor so deeply. So, uh, She's, she gets a lot of abuse, but here is this man, this handsome, charming, wonderful man who sees something in her that, that no one has seen in her since her father um, and sees more in her in a romantic way, and she's captivated by him. And Franklin's mother, Sarah, who has an interesting personality of her own, she, she likes Eleanor until she figures out that her son wants to marry Eleanor and then the story changes. So um, unfortunately she does her Sarah does her best to 
you know, sort of hold out. Hopefully, Franklin will come to his senses and not marry her. Sarah takes Franklin on this long tour, this long cruise, worldwide cruise to get her away, but it doesn't deter him at all. And they are, in fact, I've got my notes here, they are, in fact, married um, on St. Patrick's Day in 1905. And um, their marriage, I believe, starts out rather successfully. They have their first of six children, five of which will live into um, adulthood. I have to count, I'll make sure. Their first child was a daughter named Anna, Anna Eleanor, and, and they're followed by a succession of sons. Um, the last one of which was born in 1916, and that date is, um, I think, kind of telling. And I'm trying to look to see there is one son, bless him, born in 1909, Franklin Delano Jr., who, who does not survive. So, but their marriage seems to be going along rather well, and they're about to hit two major snags. They've gotten past, um, they've gotten past um, Sarah's disapproval. I will let you know that once they're married, she insists that they come and live with them. Now, I've said for a long time that I would, would love that my children would always want to live with Dr. Justice and myself, um, with their families and, and our, our children before they were old enough to understand. Uh, always talked about that, coming to live with mom and dad. And, and while I can say that sounds great to me, I, I as, a, as a young newlywed, you're probably pretty happy that you don't live with your in-laws and your husband's probably happy that he doesn't live with his in-laws. But, you know, in, we can, in reality here, I think it must have been extremely difficult for Eleanor to live um, with Sarah, knowing that Sarah just couldn't stand her and that she was never um, desired by Sarah um, as a daughter-in-law. But, but they will become um, partners in crime, as it were, down the road. Now, here's where we get into our bumps in the road. In 1918, when um, she's either packing or unpacking for her husband, Eleanor will open a letter that is obviously from her social secretary, Lucy Mercer, thinking that the letter is for her, for her, for Eleanor. And the letter was actually to Franklin, and it was a letter that revealed a long-standing four-year affair between the two. And Eleanor will never recover from this. And... Um, she intended to divorce him. Now, she had five children and she had the she had the wealth, the financial security. Excuse me, she will have the financial security, I believe, to raise the children or provide for the children, and certainly Franklin did. That wouldn't have been an issue. But this is a man who is on his way up the political ladder. And Sarah, being the social maven that she is, does not want a divorce in the family. So she tells Franklin, if the marriage ends, so too does any inheritance that you have. And your political career will be over before it's really had a chance to get started in earnest. Now, he has had some, he has had some positions, um, including Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a position that he really wanted to hold because his distant cousin, Teddy, had held that. So, um, 
he he is a man with um, great aspirations within the Democratic Party as opposed to the Republican Party. So the two the two combatants, uh, Eleanor and Franklin, decide for an assortment of reasons. I'm so sorry for an assortment of reasons to keep the family together. His political career, the inheritance, and the well-being of their children, and that's probably the correct order. Um, the well-being of the children. I, I don't believe in divorce, and I believe that the scripture is very clear about it, but I think that their marriage was so toxic that staying together um, tarnished the children's view of their parents, tarnished their children's view of marriage, and was ultimately a part of the many marriages and divorces that they all experienced. And um, Eleanor recognized that later in life and felt a deep sense of regret about it. Um, what is so odd to me is Lucy Mercer was a Roman Catholic, and she did not believe in divorce and did not want to be married to a divorced man. Oh, I'm not as sleepy as I sound, and I'll make you yawn doing that. Yet she carried on this relationship with him. When the discussions were being carved out about what would be necessary to keep the marriage together, Eleanor said, no more Lucy. Lucy must leave this relationship. But she also removed him from her own marriage bed. And, you know, Here's where we get into some really difficult discussion. It's better for another class. <clears throat> I've read um, a great history of the Roosevelts during the World, the World War II years, written by Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is a, a great historian to my mind. I don't agree with her political views, but she has taken very seriously this admonition of being a historian as a woman, but not writing simply women's history. She's amazing in the things that she's done and what she has written. But she has tackled with this issue of the nature of their relationship. And there were instances within the fam within their ongoings. Now, see, he doesn't die until 1945. He dies in early April 1945. So this is 1918. So they lived together in what their son Elliot called, um, no, it's not Elliot, it's Jimmy. Jimmy says, this is an armed truce, which endured until the day he died. And there were times throughout this era where Franklin would beg her, would, would logically argue with her, would physically extend his arms to her. Um, for a, a resumption of their physical relationship. Even though he suffered from polio, he probably had some, it is believed he had some ability um, in, in that area. And I'm sorry to say that. I'm just trying to tell you this to see, to show you the way she was. And she would not hug him. She would not, she, she was asked um, near the end of his life by him, could we restore our marriage? And she said, I will think about it. And she came back the next day and said, no. And I, I don't, I think she was punishing him for this infidelity. And it's a, ter it's terrible. It breaks my heart. She never forgave him. She, she talked about that infidelity. She humiliated him with it like a cross. And scripture doesn't support that. Scripture doesn't support what he did, but scripture doesn't support her treatment of him either. There are many who speculated that she carried on a series of lesbian relationships. I don't know the historical or the historicity or the historical veracity of that. 
but it is it is accepted um, in scholarly circles as a fact. So that's all I can say. Um, and those care were carried, some of those were carried on while he was still alive. And that breaks my heart um, for them. Not long after, so let's let's say 1918, she um, she finds out about this relationship. She says, no more Lucy, no more me. In 1921, and I want to make sure I got my dates correct, Franklin became ill. And he almost died. And it was accepted at that time that what he was suffering from was polio. And there's been some discussion of that in recent years. Well, it could have been, um, oh, I think the Guillain-Barre syndrome. There could have been other things that were working against him, a growth on his spine. We're not sure. But polio is still kind of the conventional wisdom. But he lost his ability to walk. And he tried so hard to come back to that. And to her credit, she and his mother worked together to try to restore his health. Um, Eleanor, when he was at his very sick, most sick, most ill, she didn't leave his side. So she was very dutiful in that time. And I think if she had nursed him and encouraged him to get back with his life, that he would have just lived um, lived in, off the wealth that he had and done nothing. Sarah, in fact, didn't want him to return to politics, and Eleanor thought that that is something that would really help him, um, you know, have a will to live for something, and she was right. He will, in 1928, be elected as governor of New York, and then ultimately in 1932, be elected to the first of four terms, 32, 36, 40, and 44. He's elected unprecedented amount of terms. And in fact, the Constitution will be amended in order to prevent this from happening again. Now, as First Lady, I think she was a constant thorn in his side. Her views tended to be quite a bit left of his own. Yes, he was a Democrat. Yes, he was someone who was considered the champion of the common man. But she flirted, Brianne, with socialism. And in so doing, frightened those within his own party and his political enemies who were as afraid of communism as they were of fascism. Once we're in World War II, she, you know, she, she, yes, we had to make friends with Joe Stalin, Uncle Joe, um, but everyone was very wary of the, of the potential of socialism, Marxism, communism, and she seemed to hobnob right along with it. She would counter him. She would embarrass him at dinners. She would walk into cabinet meetings demanding things and upset serious negotiations with her own demands. She loved to disagree with him publicly and he would have to make excuses for her. And this really was the nature of their relationship for the rest of his life. Um, She, and this is, I guess, as a, as a wife and mother, this bothers me. She had a housekeeper, um, Mrs. Henrietta Nesbitt. And I have the skinny on Mrs. Nesbitt from, what did I do with it? A very interesting book by none other than Margaret Truman. And Margaret Truman was, of course, the daughter of Harry and Bess Truman. And she loves to gossip. Uh, she loves to gossip. It's a great book, and I've actually considered... Well, no, let me be careful. I think I've told you this. Um, it's a great book in terms of being interesting. You can't put it down. But it's just a little bit too loosey-juicy, you know what I mean, um, to to use. You know, she doesn't say anything um, that you can't say in mixed company. 
but she is it's a little bit too gossipy for it to be really textbook it's got to be it's not it's well no here you go it's not boring enough to be a textbook so but she talks about mrs nesbitt and mrs nesbitt and i believe that this was in conjunction with eleanor if if franklin said um i really I really um, don't want broccoli again this week. He'd have it every day for the rest of the month. I mean, she she just loves sticking it to the president. And I believe this was in conjunction with Eleanor. He used to have upstairs in the president's quarters, he had a little kitchenette. And she made sure that it was shut down and not stocked at all. Absolutely useless. It was the one thing, place he could go at night without rousing the servants and get, as my daughter would say, snackage. He could get snacks in the night and things like that. And she, she eliminated that. Um, and she didn't want the servants waking up or him to use them to get his snacks at night. All on the surface of, this is a lot of passive aggressive behavior, but all on the surface of, you know, watching his health. And that wasn't it at all. He could have all the alcohol upstairs that he wanted to but snacks and things like that. And Mrs. Nesbitt was just, um, I think the power here went to her head and she'll try some of um, really high handed and unkind tactics after the president dies and Harry Truman comes to the White House. Mrs. Nesbitt will try some of that sort of ugliness and um, Mrs. Truman will fire her, which is, you know, a good move. Um, I thought one time about writing some kind of scholarly article based on a quote that Eleanor says. She says, I have never tried to influence Franklin on anything he did. You know, if I had said that and I were her, I'd be afraid. I would listen out for some thunder. So, uh, because lightning is about to strike. She constantly tried to influence him, and if he didn't go along with her, she would really not handle it very well. She would really get angry and embarrass him, you know, literally, you know, stick a finger in his face, argue with him at state dinners about things, bring things up at the most inopportune moments. She stayed away from her husband as much as possible, um, and their White House years were years of both um, a great patriotism that they shared and a great acrimonious coexistence that they shared. Um, it's not quite the same as Florence and Warren, but maybe it's not too far off. As you all, as you know, in 1945, he is down in Warm Springs when he suffers a fatal stroke. And many had been afraid uh, that he would die, Churchill especially. Many had been afraid that he would die um, earlier than he did and were surprised that he hung on as long as he did because his health was just in such bad shape. It was terrible. He had a terrible problem with blood pressure. And that's, you know, decades before they had the medication now that, that like they have now that can control it. And it's just a uh, very sad, very, very sad. Um, Franklin will continue to carry on relationships with women, you know, and I don't want to say it's because she had turned him away, turned her, turned him away from their marriage relationship. I don't necessarily want to say that that wouldn't have happened had things been right between them. Um, I don't know how much she knew about these relationships. What she did not know is that Lucy Mercer, at the end of his life, had come fully back into his life. And in fact, uh, when he was at Warm Springs, Lucy, at the time of his death, Lucy is with him. And she is with him when he dies. And Anna, their daughter, was complicit in getting Lucy there and helping with the arrangements um, to have her there, and I don't think Eleanor was ever able to forgive her daughter. Oh, sorry for being a partner in that particular crime. And I've gone longer than I meant to. Eleanor Roosevelt is an interesting character who had a very active role as First Lady. 
She was involved in all kinds of organizations, um, certainly, certainly organizations that were that had a social conscience, but unfortunately also some organizations that have been infiltrated by communists. And you have to look at her as someone who we're just not quite sure about. Um, she is hailed by the women's movement as unquestionably the greatest of all the first ladies. And if you look back at some of your, at some of the, um, oh, what do I want to say? Um, some of the polls for first lady, she's always at the top or right close to it. And that's unfortunate because I think they have one of the worst marriages. And I really think she's one of the worst individuals who held this position. So, but she's interesting, and their marriage is interesting, and he's interesting, and I've come to appreciate him more the older I get, even though I may have disagreed with a lot that he did. I can't, you know, I, th I think his relationship with Churchill is very interesting, and I do believe, again, providentially, he's, he's the man of the hour. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Next time you watch, I think it's, is it Toy Story 1 or 2, where there's a, a discussion of Mrs. Nesbitt. I want you, if you ever see that again or hear that, you will think about our Mrs. Nesbitt in the, uh, in the White House kitchen, fixing the present in a dish he despised over and over and over. So I hope you'll enjoy watching this, and I, and I want you to, and I'll probably send you an email today, I want you to get back to me and let me know something that you would you know, what do you want to cover in our time together? So you take care and thank you. And um, I'll look forward to talking to you on tomorrow. Bye-bye, Brian.